Well, good morning. I'm Sue. This is Megan and Justin. Why don't we go around and introduce ourselves? Both of you. <laughs> okay, great. Um, hi, my name is Megan uh, Massinelli. I'm trained as an archivist, which means that <clears throat> I have a little bit of background in um, assessing, organizing, preserving historical records, um, primary resource material like letters, photographs, diaries. Um, I'm not a web archivist. I have a little bit of, t of technical understanding, but not a lot of skill or practice in the matter, but um, it's very interesting to me to think about um, web archiving and certainly today and increasingly primary documents are being created in a digital format. And so knowing how we can preserve that for the future is very important. Hi. Hello. Um, my name is Justin Lang. I, uh, I've been writing uh, my blog, Columbo, for about five years. And my interest has been in cataloging just, you know, my take on the Hill District, which also comes, I, I often have said to my wife that it really should be Halumbo things that Bonnie tells her husband. Um, <laughs> Bonnie's my wife. Bonnie's a long time, born and raised in the Hill District, um, works for the Hill District Consensus Group. So my take is on a certain perspective of the Hill District, but I've tried to take and share that over time and thinking that, you know, the Hill District is changing and in the future some of this that stuff could be interesting. Um, but then I also work as a program officer in the Arts and Culture Program with the Heinz Endowments. And in that way, I'm in, involved in some of archiving from a different perspective, in terms of you know what gets into museums, um, you know what is the curatorial perspective, particularly around race and culture, um, who do we say is worth commemorating and showing and touring um, when people come to a place. So I, I come to it from that perspective, and then I'm, I'm new to the archiving online piece, so I've just enjoyed learning already just a little bit of that conversation. And I'm Sue Kerr. I have a blog called Pittsburgh Lesbian Correspondence. And for the last two years, I've been working on a specific community art project that happens to be an archive. Um, we're, creating, we're collecting and creating blog posts telling the stories of LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer folks from throughout Western Pennsylvania. And it's in their own first person voice. I ask them questions, they respond, and I publish. And the idea is we have now over 150 contributions, and it lives on my blog, which helps draw traffic to it. But what started my interest in this whole topic was when I met Megan about just about a year ago, and I was thinking about what's going to happen in 10 years to all this information that I've collected. Because it's, it's, it's kind of a one-of-a-kind perspective on this region. And I started thinking about things like, um, keeping it hosted on my website, how long will that go on? What happens if I'm not able to run my website or something happens to me? Where will that material go? And wh what would I do with it? There is no LGBTQ specific um, archive to this region. There are some f national sites, but that's what started the conversation right. years ago, uh, well, a year ago, I guess. And then I um, obviously see it in a broader context because a lot of my blogging is about things that are not just LGBTQ. It's about, I write about feminism, I write just about Pittsburgh, I write about politics, and lots of kinds of things. And of course we have to chronicle cats. What are we gonna do? We have to make sure that the, the, the cat lady love is well understood in 25 years. And I joke, but it's, it's you know, these are not, it, it's very complicated. Now I back up my blog. I use a WordPress plugin and do that. So if my blog were to fail, I would be covered. Um, I've actually had that happen. I've migrated my blog twice. I'm in the process of, of migrating it right now because of a um, website overhaul. So that technical side is something that I've been used to. But when we started having the conversation for this panel, we realized with Justin that not every blogger has been exposed to that. So we're going to get to the to the how part of it, but first we wanted to just talk a little bit about the why. Because why would people want to read your blog in 100 years or 200 years? And it you may be thinking that that 
isn't realistic, that people aren't going to care. Whereas, you know, people would care about the, the social cultural impact of the Hill District in the early 21st century. That sort of makes sense as, as something that would people would care about. And also the LGBT community is a, is a minority community that isn't well chronicled. But what about the, the parenting blogs and the, the sports blogs and the, the food blogs and all that sort of thing? Now, I personally, because I like to hoard things, think that all of that would be interesting. But, you know, and I tend to think of it as, what would your great-grandchildren want to know about life in Pittsburgh in the early 2010s, I guess? <laughs> in, and what, what, what kinds of information would they be looking for? And that's, that's the premise that I started from. And I asked both of them, Megan and Justin, that question. And do either of you want to jump in and talk about the, the why? Yeah, yeah, so um, we did create, I think, a very visually interesting presentation to have behind us, but it's not quite working out, so just know that I'm looking at something um, that, uh, that kind of uh, illustrates, I, I made a little bit of a comparison here between maybe some traditional records that you would find in an archive, like letters, photographs, diaries, film, ledgers, um, financial ledgers, reel-to-reel -reel, um, film and audio, and how the archive of the future would look, which would be, which would contain emails, digital photographs, um, maybe your Facebook content, um, digital video and spreadsheets. Um, and something that is very fascinating to me about blogs is that um, as a digital medium, it really, um, can contain a multitude of these um, formats, um, which makes it kind of maybe a technical challenge to preserve um, in the past letters, photographs, these types of things are paper-based and you know a physical medium that per, you know possibly you can neglect um, for a little bit in a cold, cool, um, dark place, and it might last. But if you're going to keep a hard drive, or many of you, you know, probably have floppy disks laying around somewhere. Um, it's not going to be accessible if you just leave it alone. So, um, really paying attention to identifying those records now so that we'll have them. Yeah. And again, um, so my my I guess experience in terms of trying to keep a record of things has been a little bit different. Um, but I do think it's connected. So, for example, when in the Hill District we were working on a community benefits agreement, there was a group called One Hill CBA, which is a variety of folks who were working on getting a community benefits agreement. Um, and one of the things that I'm really happy about is that we had a, and I thought of this when we were doing it, so um, from another group I had experience with the Yahoo groups, and so I set up a Yahoo groups to um, catalog conversation, and, and I was part of the steering committee and keep some record of that work and we had a lot of conversations, a lot of different conversations. There was some real disagreement between the Hill District Consensus Group, which organized, and Hill District CDC, which was, had a different way of going at a community benefits agreement. And we cataloged a huge record of all of this stuff on the Yahoo site. And I've kept it active all the time, knowing that at one point it could be really useful. What I'm happy about is that now, kind of hearing this conversation, what to go and do with it now. Uh, I want to go, I'm like, as soon as I get home, like, I want to go make sure that it's still, <laughs> like, it's still okay. Um, uh, AOL so, just bought Yahoo. Oh, did they? So, so you're you better go run home. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I got to go. Um, so, you know, I guess one of the questions that I, I had in starting this, um, I wonder if it's okay to go here. I, I um, So I started looking at some of the, the conversations, and, you know, Megan shared with us a kind of a whole list of how to, to do this, and my first thing that I did was I... I tried to export one of one of the articles um, that got a lot of feedback on the Hill District was a blog I wrote a few years ago um, when people had uh, 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 some folks had created the Pittsburgh Black political such and such. It was to support Jake Wheatley's campaign, and I wrote a blog saying I thought you could draw a connection between the Hill District's particular politics about why it might be bad for Peduto for certain sections of the Hill District and then what that could lead to. And it got a lot of traffic, way more traffic than I'd ever seen before from a blog post. It kind of blew me away. I wasn't used to that kind of like feedback. I thought, well, that'd be one of the things that I would want to try to, 
to record, hold on to, right? Because it felt like that was an example of community saying that was that was germane. So I tried to export one of the posts, and I did export it. But what, what I was surprised by when I came back to me was like, it, this looked like gobbledygook. I mean, it was like the commas written out, so on and so forth. And then I couldn't figure out where to put it. Um, so I guess I wondered if you guys might say something about what you do, Sue, there. And I, I mean, again, as I'm learning this whole thing, I, I didn't, I had it, and I was like, now what do I do with it? I'll, I'll go as a blogger first, just real quick. Oh. And then, so just, you know, as another blogger who doesn't have archiving or technical experience, I just keep it and let my web guy deal with it. Okay. So it is. Who's the web guy? But, well, I pay him. Okay. So <laughs> that's the thing. I have uh, my web host that I pay him for some things. and because I work with a company that's owned by an individual person. And then I have a web designer who's been working on my site who helps me sometimes with things. So I call them both the web guy. And so literally I don't know how to read that or what it means. I just know what to do. So I keep it, I export it, it emails me, and then I save it on Google Drive where I have some storage, and then I save another copy on Dropbox. And then my web host backs up their, from their end as well. But sometimes that doesn't back up some of the design elements and things like that. But So I follow instructions, I should say, and then I have somebody, and I would have to pay them, you know, if something went drastically wrong to restore everything. So um, that's my solution, which isn't a solution that most people even realize is out there or is, is accessible by cost, you know, but, so that's, so you need a web guy. A guy, guy. <laughs> So I'm just going to back up to kind of explain a little bit why maybe exporting is something you want to do instead of just thinking because, and we were sort of talking about this as we were walking in, there is, um, there's a uh, thought that because it's on the internet, it is preserved, um, but we know that that's not true. We know for a variety of reasons things disappear from the internet, links rot over time, websites disappear. Um, user agreements um, and terms of use. Um, Google has deleted people's blogs for a variety of reasons. Um, so getting your site off of a proprietary platform and then even on a more granular level, saving those files that you export in open formats that can be read by um, by a wider variety of software programs so that you're not relying on proprietary software um, is very important. I like to think um, of blogs in Pittsburgh that I would think would be some, something that people might want to read. So, for example, are you all familiar with the blog yajagoff.com? So, it's, it's a very popular blog. Um, John is here somewhere, I'm sure, and it's, 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 it's amusing, but in 100 years of people even gonna understand the joke of the, the name and the blog itself calls out Jagoffs and it's funny and it's it's very well written and it's, it's, it's a humor blog. But he does get into some pretty interesting cultural issues here in Pittsburgh and um, we, I think that that would be something that would be important to preserve not just as from the humor perspective but also just from the hidden, you know, the underlying cultural piece. And you know, one thing I'll, I'll bring up is you know he talks about the Kenny Chesney concert and the trash, and you know that there's something that comes up a lot. And I live in Manchester, right by the stadium, so there's an under lots of underlying themes there around uh, suburban folks visiting the, the the predominantly black neighborhood in the North Side and what happens and how people treat it and how we respond to it. Wherever you fall on the Kenny Chesney spectrum and the litter spectrum, I still think it's an interesting conversation to to preserve. But in a in a larger context, not just because in and of itself it happened, that doesn't make it important. It's it's it it's because it taps into things that are real and important and significant in our region. So, capturing a blog like that would be very important. Um, Berg Baby is another one. I think she's been blogging for ten years, and she is chronicling life of suburb, you know suburban family and. and Pittsburgh, and she's doing it for her family. Personally, she said that, you know, that's her goal. She's doing this for her daughters. But it's wonderful. She's a tremendous writer, probably the, one of the best blog writers I've ever encountered. And, you know, and I think that her photography and her writing is something that will matter for people to understand what life is like here for a, a working family raising two kids and all the kind of things that they're interested in. 
And I could go on and on with different blogs, but you know, I actually just kind of believe everybody's blog should be kept because how awesome would it be in 200 years or 100 years if people had access, to, live access to the 500 plus blogs that exist in, in Western Pennsylvania. But when we talk about access, I think what we have to make really clear is right now you can get on your phone or your computer or go out to the library and you, anyone can get to these blogs. They just need internet access. That, and I don't say just lightly. I understand that not everybody has internet access, but we have libraries, we have public access spots, we have Wi-Fi and hotspots and all of that. So this information, if it's not locked down by the owner, is accessible to people. But for it, my blog to be accessible in 100 years, I'm gonna have to create an endowment fund to pay the web hosting. There's really no mechanism that exists that I can access until we get to the archive situation. You know, well, that's one of the reasons we wanted to talk about this. That you know, I'm not going to fund $250 a year for 100 years. <laughs> like I don't have those resources, and how it would, how people would get to it because technology in, a, in 100 years could be vastly different. I mean, think now if you if you look at me when when Justin said Yahoo uh, groups, I was smirking because I was like, that's so 1990s, yeah. you know. But yeah. it's it's but it's true. Or Facebook. All of our information is on Facebook, and Facebook owns it. Instagram, which is owned by Facebook, is another great example. If you take your photo with the Instagram app, you don't have a high resolution copy of it that you can do whatever you want with. You have to download it, and you're not gonna have that beautiful uh, image, which is a tip I learned at PodCamp a long time ago. And, and so how to manage all of this when it's constantly changing is, is really difficult, but I think it's important that we start planning and one thing I had thought about is maybe Pittsburgh needs to have this conversation on an ongoing basis among all of the bloggers and podcasters. We're not leaving podcasters out because they're very much part of this. So one thing we did is we started a Facebook group called Your Blog is History. And we would encourage every blogger to join and be part of that dialogue. Megan is gonna recruit every archivist in the region, or at least three or four others, to, to <laughs> join and help us have this conversation because is is it something that we should take ownership of and responsibility for and say, you know, should we be creating a Western Pennsylvania blogging archive? And what does that mean and how much will it cost and where will it be hosted? Or should we be pushing our other existing archives to be prepared to handle the blogs? I'm not sure what the answer is, but you know, I think it's definitely a conversation we should talk about now rather than after the fact when we say, boy, we wish we still had access to, because there are several blogs that are gone, and it's really unfortunate that we've lost them. I mean, I'm sure we could get them back if we tried, but what would we do with them? And Megan, you're the one who has the answer to that. What would we do with them? Yeah, well, um, so. Am I jumping ahead things. on this? <laughs> um, a couple things. Um, one, I, I guess I kind of wanted to speak to that uh, like personal perspective on contemporary issues, maybe if you're if that's what you're blogging about or your personal life, um, these are things that are not new. I mean, in the archive, personal news accounts, oral histories, um, uh, diary entries. These are the things that are, as an archivist, I think of as the most valuable and um, the most useful for for research and um, and scholarship. So um, there are some examples of the ways in which professional archivists and librarians are kind of grappling this problem with this problem of web archiving um, but it is something that you know as technology changes so quickly um, it's in a continuously evolving process so um, one of the big players is of course the Internet Archive which is based in San Francisco but they have uh, the Wayback Machine which some of you may be familiar with which uses web crawlers to capture websites at different points in time. They are dynamic, so they will capture links to a certain extent within those page, within those sites and pages within those sites. Um, but many websites that have been um, taken down for various reasons can still be accessed through the Wayback Machine. The Library of Congress has a web archiving program that is primarily based around um, news sites. And they have a really good blog post um, and a, a blog 
called The Signal, which is all about their digital preservation efforts and has wonderful personal digital preservation tips um, there. But they talk a little bit about how they make decisions on which sites to include in their archiving program. And um, Huffington Post is one that they, they talk about um, as a blog a, a current events blog that they want to capture because they don't just want to um, capture, you know, CNN and NPR, things that exist in multiple platforms and um, are kind of larger conglomerates. Um, there are tons of content management systems out there of uh, varying price levels. <laughs> Um, and uh, ease of use. Uh, one that I really like to use and have used for several different types of archiving projects is one called Omeka, O-M-E-K-A. Um, and it is developed, I believe, out of a university um, whose name I can't recall right now, but um, it, universities are also using it, but as a as a person, as an individual person, you can um, set up an Omeka archive and as, you know, community archive. I, I believe it is a very good community archiving tool. Um, one of the um, outstanding examples of Omeka is University of Washington St. Louis has a documenting Ferguson archive that they began um, very close after uh, the murder of Mike Brown in 2014. 14. Um, so it's still it's still up to date and it's a lot of user generated content. So Omeka, sort of like WordPress, um, incorporates a lot of plugins, including Internet Archive's Archivit tool, which uses web crawlers to capture websites, so people can contribute their blog entries um, about events going on or what have you. Um, so those are some solutions. Um, you know, if you're wanting to create a community blogging archive, um, but because everyone uses a, a different platform um, and, you know, a variety of other considerations, um, it's just something to, I think, continue the conversation about. You know, another part I was thinking about to the why of this, you know, I feel like even writing a blog is kind of like your first step at saying some of your thoughts are important. It's kind of scary, actually, I find, to even say to people, like, I'm going to do a blog. I mean, I think in a place of bloggers, it's it's less of a, it's more, obviously, it's, it's the common thing. But in the general world, it's still not a very common thing. And to blog is to have to, I think, stand up and say, I have something that's worth saying, and then therefore that's something that is worth, in some sense, preserving. And I think that's a very scary thing. And I, I do liken it to the world of arts, where people are very uncomfortable to say that they're artists. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real statement to say, I'm an artist, because then all of a sudden you feel like, I've got to show you my work, and it's got to be at a level that you like it, and if I, maybe I'll fail. So people often, particularly in, in um, non-white communities, you'll see people who are incredible artists, but they won't use that term, right? Because it's been codified as kind of like the space of, of like, you know, those who know and can demonstrate the Western canon. And everybody who can't do that, who doesn't do that, is not interested in that, is not quite an artist. And so I think even in, in blogging, it's still a similar space of like, you know, if, if someone's not paying me to write or do these things, is it worth having or is it worth doing? And, and archiving, you know, as I'm listening to you all, I feel like is the next step of that same advancement of my ideas matter. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think even just the, the idea of archiving my work is like another commitment to myself and my writing and what I'm doing. <clears throat> so I just like that. I, I just like that as a, even as a personal practice of taking one's own work more seriously, mm -hmm. that archiving I feel like is another, even just a, even in the, in the ongoing cultivation of one's voice, to me archiving beyond whoever sees it, then becomes the, 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 another step in the cultivating of your voice. When I started blogging in 2005, I called my blog Pittsburgh Lesbian Correspondence, and it was sort of a joke based on some radio appearances I had done with John McIntyre back then. He was on KDKA, and, and it was really meant to be just my own personal thoughts on things. And very quickly, I became categorized as a political blogger. 
And it took me a while to realize that it was because the act of being a lesbian in this region in the 2005, 2006, and having opinions about political things was very political even if I had opinions about other kinds of things. And you know, there were really only two or three of us who were women, we were all white, you know, who were part of this circle. And it was a, it was, it was a very interesting experience. I, you know, I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that, but I would hate for that to be lost because it, it wasn't just the fact that I was writing, I wasn't even really writing this really radical LGBTQ stuff, it was more of a chronicle, like I would post events and, and, and just be kind of a resource. But when, when I've thought about quitting, I keep coming back to the fact that really you know, there are a handful of other queer bloggers out there, and, but they don't you know, tend to have the time, the resources you know, that to, keep, to keep going, and I want to lift up what they're writing too. That's one of the reasons we started the Amplify Project is that you know, I have 173 people have responded, and about a third of them are anonymous. I, mean, I know who they are, but they don't. We don't publish their name, and they couldn't tell their story in any other format. They couldn't tell it via video, because we'd have to use a screen and, you know, protect their voices. I mean, there's so many things, so because it, it's really dangerous in some areas, to come out. And so I feel like it's it's I don't want to say community service, but it's 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 an important that I have after 10 years of blogging, I have an audience that I use that to take other voices and, and make sure that people have access to them. And I'm not, and I ask people to blog for me all the time, but um, it doesn't pay well, so nobody, you know, it's not something to do. But by projects like Amplify, I can invite people to be part of that archive. They'll be part of that historical record. And then, you know, finding a way to continue to promote that. Because frankly, a lot of people read the, the Amplify posts, but more people read my actual blogging. And that's why I keep them tied together. I didn't just start a website for, for Amplify because I knew it would be a lot of work to get people to read it. And this way, when they're on my blog reading other kinds of things, they see referral links and they yeah. see you know, the building. So it's sort of using my privilege that I've built up and it to, to highlight these experiences. But it's, you know, it's really unfortunate. I mean, I hear this a lot too. People are like, I could never write a blog. And I'm like, well, you could. Really, I mean, because there's free software, and you, can, you all know this. I mean, you get started; it's not difficult. But it's that mindset, and I think too that people have that idea that their experiences, their voices, are not something that would matter in the historical context. Well, it matters to their grandkids and their great grandkids, and you know, their nieces and nephews and whomever you know would, would want to know those kinds of things. So I want to just mention too that it's you could archive for your personal network. You don't have to put it on a website where it's going to be accessible to the whole world. It could be something that you just preserve in a way that you can pass down like you would photos or baby books or, or, or anything that came from your grandmother to you and how, how precious that is now. So uh, you know, it's, that's something I think we could consider as well. Because right now there are bloggers who have their blogs set to private and they only allow certain people to read them. And that may be what they want to do in the future, but there still may be people who would love who would love to read them. So there's a lot of questions here, which is again why we set the Facebook group up so that we could continue having these kinds of conversations. And of course, Facebook is a proprietary <laughs> platform. So we'll have to, you know, we, we could have gone to Google, I guess, but I mean, what's, what's one or the other? So we have to think about how we capture the kinds of things people say in response to these ideas. Yeah, and I'll say that um, the resource list that we created is available on Google Drive. So if anyone's interested in it and they don't ha they don't want to use Facebook, please come up and I'll I can share it with you. Um, um, yeah, so I guess um, in terms of the how, if if I could move there, yeah, um, uh, I have a couple of like top tips that we include in the resource list. Um, that you know, depending on whether you want an archive to be accessible in the future, uh, accessible to the public in the future or not, um, they're good to follow. So the first one is you know taking stock of all that you have that you want to archive. Um, I mean, it's different talking about archiving your site and then archiving your digital life <laughs> because uh, it's probably spread out across a lot of different platforms and media types. Um, but doing your best to take stock of what is there, um, 
um, what's valuable for you to keep. Um, I know in in my digital life, I um, inevitably save a lot of drafts that I perhaps do not care to preserve into the future. Um, but uh, yeah, setting up some kind of um, appraisal system, if you will, of, of what you want to to take the time and energy to preserve. Um, <clears throat> then selecting an organizational structure. A lot of people are very good about this on their personal computers, creating a file directory and file tree that makes some sort of sense to you. Um, and I think, you know, as people who work in new media, you're paying attention a lot to how organization um, can facilitate the work that you're actively doing, but also keeping in mind how others are going to interpret that organizational structure um, in the future when you're not around to explain it to them. So if you're creating a different organizational structure for your archive, um, uh, documenting those decisions is very important. Um, so yeah, selecting and kind of curating your digital legacy. Um, another thing is, you know, are people going to have access um, to some of the things that you want to save? Um, I know it it is the case that some people are adding um, into their wills um, uh, parts of their digital life, um, including passwords, so that people can get into their accounts um, for backup. Um, it's really important to, um, of course, we mentioned the saving in open formats, but also saving your records um, in multiple copies. Um, the, there's a rule of threes here, um, but two is fine, I think. So maybe have, having some, um, and I think Sue talked about this too with her, with her site, um, saving your materials in um, maybe in the cloud, also on your computer, um, maybe on an optical disk, but those the readers for those are quickly disappearing. Um, and also saving those storage devices in physically different places because natural disasters happen and the digital world is digital, but if you're save the things that you save it on, um, are physical. <laughs> there are tons of servers um, throughout the world hosting um, the web. Um, would you like to add anything to that? Well, I, I guess I want to point out something that it is kind of obvious about that is that, you know, we are, I mean, most of us don't have wills. You know, even most, that tends to be something that people with some resources tend to use or who um, have access to an attorney or consider that they have an estate to handle on, let me put it that way. So some people don't think of a blog or a podcast as something of value that they have to see an attorney about. And um, also the idea that, you know, the backing up. So if you backed up on a Google Drive too often, you would use up your storage space. You'd have to pay for more. So there are costs associated with this. And so right off the bat, we're gonna you know, probably default toward preserving the, the um, born digital content created by somewhat affluent, white, cisgendered, heterosexual folks who have the resources to do these kinds of things. And I certainly think that we should preserve all of that content, but I think we have to think about how do we make sure that other voices are you know, still have access to these kinds of resources. Um, do we have like a blogging archive legal clinic to set up a will? I mean, I, I'm just kind of making stuff up flippantly, but I'm actually, why not? And do we, um, you know, look for a, and fund a server that can host lots of different kinds of software, you know, to, to host so that people could go in and physically access the blogs right there? Um, do we put a special emphasis on groups who may or may not be able to do it on their own? And, and how do you, how do you, I mean, there's, there's a lot of questions that I have because you know, I don't have an attorney, I don't have a will and I don't have, um, but my blog belongs to my LLC, but I have to, you know, there are some paperwork that I know I have to do to figure out what am I going to do with Amplify? Not just my blog, but my, that specific art project. How am I going to get it to an archive someday? And I know that I have to, figure out the cost and pay to ha have an attorney do that. And But I'm running a project where I'm getting funding. 
my general blog isn't included in that. So that's, at this point, 11 years of content, almost 3,000 posts. Plus, I've written for other websites. You know, I've written for Huffington Post. I've written for just different sites. And so would I want to preserve that? Would I want to capture that? And, you know, there's, there's a lot of questions. And I think it's important that we it, help encourage people not to be overwhelmed by the fact that they're focused on feeding their kids, getting to work, you know, and they're still creating blogs and they're dealing with all the things that happen in life every day that prevent most of us from doing long-term planning. And how do we um, add blogging or podcasting or whatever kind of digital, born digital content? Why is it born digital instead of digital born? Is that like a, does anyone, if you know that, you're gonna win a prize. Justin's gonna get you a t-shirt. <laughs> Some say. It's right up here. <laughs> you know, I, I had a question about, again, on this archiving. You know, one of the things that I, I tried to do, I, I did a little bit of tooling around as a new person to the archiving, and I found, that, you know, two thoughts. One is that I think the Facebook group, Facebook group will be useful as a place to make some mistakes and ask some questions because I didn't find it intuitive, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I didn't find, and I found even the conversation, the little bit of conversation that I read from some of the things that Megan mm -hmm. shared, I felt like, wow, as a reader, I'm expected to understand a fair amount of terminology, right? I didn't feel, it, it felt like, this, this is something very similar about art. This is why I think there's some real similarity between art and archiving and blogging. Um, this interest in talking to, to the people in the group. So a lot of, that's a lot of the challenges that art has is that the people who go to see it don't have the patience to talk about it in terms and that are not accessible to other people. And I found some of the archiving and the archivists to talk in a way they imagine talking to one another, which I think defeats, you know, it's, it makes the notion of holding on to it, you know. However, the subject was really interesting and then I thought about this Facebook group, right? And, and I wondered, what about the way, if you think about from a class perspective and race perspective, I think you see Facebook and Twitter are the blogging that people are doing more, much more of. Mm -hmm. And yet those are platforms that you don't own and can be shut down. And, and I was just talking to a, a friend of mine, he does a, a really, um, not a friend of mine, but a colleague, uh, Michael Battle, who I think records a very unique Pittsburgh voice as a black transgender man. Um, and, uh, and I wondered about, and I feel like he says a whole different part of Pittsburgh that I'm now becoming more aware of through his voice. But how do you archive Facebook? And I'm just curious about that. Yeah, so there are many different ways. Um, you can export your Facebook archive. Um, I believe they say it takes up to a day, but they email it to you. Um, and I think I actually have mine on my computer, so I'll pull it up. Um, but they give it to you in um, a couple different formats um, in HTML. Um, like my pokes are here, <laughs> uh, the settings that I have set up, uh, my wall um, is downloaded in, in HTML from Facebook. Um, so it does require, you know, maybe another level if you do not want it to, to save in HTML. Um, the photos, um, I think those uh, transport as JPEGs, if I remember correctly. But they are, again, resized by Facebook. Okay. So you don't yeah, have the raw, if yeah. you have a beautiful, you know, 1200 by 1500 photo, you're going to mm -hmm. get a 300 by 300. So mm -hmm. at least you have it, but mm -hmm. it's, it's not the same as having mm -hmm. what you originally posted. Yeah. So that's the easiest way I think to, to archive from Facebook. Cause you could go in and save as, you know, different aspects of your page yeah. or what you're producing. Um, Twitter, there are some tools um, that are on the resource document that we created that um, are plugins to browsers um, that are separate from the site um, that will download your social media content. And there's one for Twitter as well, because that in, in particular, more so than Facebook, I think is hard, a little bit harder yeah. to manage. Yeah. I think it's just, even just for the Facebook group, I think the nice thing about being on Facebook, although again, you don't, you're not controlling that platform is that it's a way to invite and because I'll, I'll you know sometimes I'll write I'll start a Facebook post and then make it my blog as somehow making it more serious it also then slows down what I'm doing because my blog is a more 
I, I take that space differently than I take Facebook. And, um, but I think I've often thought, what is really the difference between these two platforms? Like when I go over here and write a post on my blog and I write something on Facebook, I get sometimes more readers on Facebook. So why am I going here to my blog? Because my blog is a little bit more like, ooh, I'm blogging, right? Mm -hmm. Versus Facebooking. But I still think that what would be interesting is to, on Facebook would be a chance to invite other people who are not necessarily blogging in an official blogging capacity, but are doing a lot of very intentional documenting of an idea through Facebook, and that will be a nice way to engage those folks as opposed to the blogging thing, which again, I think is a certain kind of space. Well, and it's also really important to look at who who is using Facebook in particular and how we're using it. And um, I do follow the like social media trends, and you know the, they they've shown that um, Facebook, you know, there's this idea that it's all passe, which it's it's kind of a, a, a not really. There's a lot of people on Facebook, and it tends to be it does tend to be people who are older, but young people who have come from lower income families use Facebook more than all their peers. Be and that makes sense because Facebook can be very notebook, computer, laptop friendly. So if you have a computer at home but you don't have a smartphone, you can still use Facebook, but you're not necessarily going to use Snapchat or maybe Instagram or Twitter. And, and, and I, I looked at this with youth, but I think that it's true in Pittsburgh too that Facebook is a slightly older, and we're a slightly older demographic here. So I think that there are a lot of people on Facebook who are using it that way. And certainly we should invite them. Anyone I think who is interested should come to the group, but we, we can talk about how to, um, maybe, and because part of it is you, you do an export one time, but you have to remember to go back and do it every so often. That's the trick is that, yeah. you know, um, and with Facebook, um, when I went to Facebook j jail, it was with Joy and Michael. <laughs> we got, we got a, they were thrown off for longer than I was, but I was thrown off for sharing the content that th got them thrown off. And wow. we got um, shut down, so that was, you know, we say Facebook jail, and it's, it's a very smart-ass term because it's really, you know, you just get your access suspended for a day or two. Yeah, or 30 days. Like, he's right now, he's 30 days off. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, he is, because he's been, it's... It's been building. Well, because you know when we were thrown off with the same post, they were he and Joy were thrown off for less, more than me, and you know, I wonder why. <laughs> and I mean, that's, it's it's very unfortunate. But I think, you know, I wanted to take that content that got them thrown off and record it. So I then put it on my blog. So here's a good answer for you, yeah. because Facebook has rules about this content was offensive, and and I didn't agree. So I put it on my blog. Now I couldn't share that on Facebook because they would take it right down. But now it's preserved and. And I wrote from my perspective what had happened, right, and then right. Joy was writing her own perspective of what had happened. And so it was this, you know, you would need all of that information right. to really kind of understand that experience. Right. Right. Yeah. But I think that, you know, and, and so now we're starting to look at how do you create your own archive that captures multiple kinds of media right. that you use. And, and um, I, I agree 100%. So I think that Facebook is, is an important resource, but um, someday they may not let us export without paying a fee, or you know, when people pass, you know, when, when they, when, you know, when they die and their page is there and it's not known, and then what do you do? Yeah. You can ask Facebook to create a memorial out of it, but that doesn't mean you can get the info. Even if you're the designated heir, you can't necessarily get the um, their information or their their photos or anything like that. So. Um, there's a there's a lot of questions around this, and I think it's a good that we're asking them, because too often we just take it for granted that it'll always be there. I mean, it's hard to just find a post. Remember when you wrote that Facebook post and you're like, oh, so great, and then you're just like, oh, what month was it? How do I find it? And and there is a search feature, but it's not really easy to find. <laughs> so um, I I think that that's something we should really, you know. Yeah export the Facebook group. Make sure we're backing that up. Megan, that can be your job since you're okay. the official archivist of the... I'll, I'll do that. Um, Should we take any questions? Yeah. Um, I, guess I, have a final, I guess I have a final word before we take questions, if anyone has questions. Um, um, I guess, you know, I work a little bit... Um, I mean, I, I obviously think it's personal archiving is very important. Um, and I like a lot what you said about... Um, it's a step in like saying my voice matters. Um, 
and you know whether or not you want your voice to become part of an institutional archive or to exist for yourself um, or anywhere in between. Um, I try to do uh, as much you know outreach in that way as possible. Um, and it can be very overwhelming <laughs> to deal um, with these issues, um, but it's, um, you know, it's possible. And you can make a plan. Um, part, part of that um, as like a final um, recommendation is that maintenance um, and really like every year going through and making sure all your documents can open. Um, and making sure everything is in a format that um, will be accessible to people and then documenting those decisions um, and keeping that somewhere with, with your records. That's a great point because I'm terrible at that. I probably have 500 draft posts that I've just are just sitting there that I may never visit but I don't, I don't want to throw things away. But yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily want them accessible to the public in the future. Yeah, and there are tons of online um, free open source tools, and there's a tool directory linked in our resource document too. So um, it can be hard to get past maybe the insular language, but um, I'm hoping that the Facebook group will help a little bit with that. I have to find a better cover image, so I totally apologize for that. But better what? The cover image oh. for the uh, Facebook group. Two people from this group, I think joined while we were talking. So our work here has been very well received, I think. And any questions? Just make one up. No? What blog do you think should be preserved? We, we have, we've got oh. a question in the front, I think. There's someone in the front? Oh. Okay. <laughs> well, in the fourth row. <laughs> I just like imagining that, actually. I mean, <laughs> um, I mean, this conversation has helped me think about this some more. Um, and uh, I mean, I would love to imagine, you know, I have certain perspectives about, and I'd love to imagine that those ideas are more widely shared, that these are, that some of these voices, I think, that are trying to raise some issues of justice, they're like, oh, these were seeds of things to, that were you know, part of getting us to a better place than we are today. I would love to imagine that. Um, I'll say that uh, in terms of what I see in the archives and library world, there's a couple ways that people are um, creating access to born digital materials. One is um, uh, replicating the actual machines that those records are created on. So, for example, um, Salman Rushdie's uh, archives, um, there is a complete, um, I'm blanking on the, the word right now, but you can go onto a computer, a Mac computer that is set up exact, to look exactly the way it looked when he created it and organize in the way that he, he created it. Um, and you know there are backup copies of those, but that's how they're creating access for the user because um, you know the way the format and everything that goes into creating um, those records has meaning to it. Um, some other ways that um, access is being provided are by you know sending, emailing, sending. Um, through different media files to people, ma just making the inventory available to them, and then if they want that access, they get it on a more personal level. I think the way we relate to books, I mean, books are still here, <laughs> they're still being published, we still use them, um, and they may be considered out of style, but that's not really the case. I mean. And books kind of overcome some of this, um, some of the barriers we've talked about. Um, but I also, you know, let's look at the arts and talk about music. And, you know, music obviously moved from albums, eight tracks, cassettes, CDs, now we have digital downloads, but now vinyl is back. And there's, because it sounds different. It's not just 
it's not always better that you can compact it more and fit more on a different um, format because nobody's bringing back, well, they got eight tracks or cassette tapes, but they're bringing back vinyl because the way that it preserved and, rep cre and transmitted the sound of the music is considered important. So it's possible that in 100 years, you know, blogs will be back. Um, newspapers is another good example. We talk about the newspapers dying and it's a big struggle, especially for very large papers. But one group of papers that's doing better than expected are s weeklies in small communities where the publishers are not trying to make a lot of money, but they can pay their employees and earn a living themselves and, and provide a news outlet. So the Valley Mirror and Homestead is actually making a profit while our big papers are, are bleeding money and so there's a there's a people crave access to that information and there's other small newspapers that are popping up but they they may be different it may not be to make money it may be to capture the local news and provide a resource for that for people to access it so i think we might be surprised in a hundred years how blogs look given the fact that we don't always just discard old media and move on to something new you know and just another thought about that Hundred years question, I think, and the archiving. And I think why well, I appreciate, you know, again, the, the, the group and the chance to go through and look at, you know, this is the way to do it, um, and the notion of thinking that my voice will be wanted in a hundred plus years, is, um, you know, one of the things I've thought about is, you know, the way that we're creating so much history. So Facebook, I mean, history just being in terms of being what's documented, not what happened, um, and uh, and so we're creating huge amounts of history. I mean, it's. Just, I mean, I don't think. I, I wonder if there's ever been this much physical history um, on a daily basis, right? You know, I was even, you know, untagged myself from something today, thinking I don't even want this part of history. I don't want to sign on to, right? Um, but I recognize it's going. But I'm not going to facilitate it, right? Um, but I, I wondered ab about how we help people find us. So it's going to be kind of a sea, a mass, right? And then who will rise to the, be found in that process and who will have thought through how to find me? So I, I like this archiving in that it's an intentional way to say, I know it's going to be a mass of information, right? So let me, in a sense, um, it's kind of like that, you know, put a note in a bottle and throw it out or what people used to do in terms of like these time capsules, which is much more intentional. Um, versus just leaving your stuff around and hoping that somebody comes across it. And so I just, I like the idea of archiving as being like, I know it's gonna just be so crowded out here, I better do some things so that you can find me because you won't, you won't be able, you may, not, you may not find me. And it may not be you. It may be that people in a, in a, in a we might say like a, a sub-community or, or a specific intentional community may say, um, it's not my blog that we wanna say, but we want to say sure. this other blog yeah. And how do we work together to, do that. to make that happen? And um, having that conversation, you know, is really important. When I met Megan at a, at a meeting, um, there was a professor there from Pitt Bradford, I think he was, and he was in the process of, of creating a journal. Um, I mean, of of trying to promote a journal that he had from the early 20th century, and I can't think of the name of the man who wrote it, but the assumption, he was a single white man, and he lived in rooming houses, and then he sort of made his way up into society, and he chronicled society events and things. And I had the impression that because he was a single white man, he was an escort to people, you know, that he was eligible to kind of take the ladies to places, and you know, early, 19, early 20th century mores, but the thing is is that the idea was that he was probably gay. But he never says that. He doesn't use that. He doesn't even really use the kinds of coded language that we would look for in that era. So that's what this analysis is about, is, is, is examining um, this content that was created and is very unusual because working class men did not write journals in the early 20th century. They didn't have time. You know, they were working, you know, and, but he did. And it's important, and I hope that the journal itself will be publicly accessible one day, but certainly the, you know, the analysis of it. But I just keep, I keep coming back to that all the time where people, you know, that he, self-identity and what did that mean? Because you know, we really, really don't know, know and we'll never know. And I mean, he's long gone, so hopefully he doesn't mind, you know, but, but I, you, know, you think about 
when we think about archiving, we have to think about those kinds of questions too. Like who's who's going to read this information? Like, do you want to leave your art, you know, as an LGBTQ person, this is a particularly relevant that may not be out to certain people, you know, do you want to leave it and have your mother read it? Or would you rather, and with a historical archive, you can often set some caveats on that so that it might not be accessible until after maybe you're, you know, 50 years after you've passed so that that way you don't have to kind of worry about those things that you worry about in your day-to-day -day life. And, and I know that's not exclusive to the gay community, but, you know, I think that there's, there, there are some things to consider as well that maybe you don't want your someday kids reading your blog from your wild and carefree 20s. Or maybe, you know, I don't know. Or maybe you, you're not sure. So there's a lot of questions to, to ask around this in terms of timeliness as well. Maybe you would rather it be 100 years down the road, not 20 or 30, you know. Or read your Facebook page. <laughs> That's probably where it's a little bit more um, revealing. And so we answer your question? Yes. Okay. Oh, we're almost ready to wrap up. One more question? We have time. We can fit it in. You're fighting each other to get. Please join the group. You can find it under your blog is history. And if you can't find it, you can just tag one of us on Facebook, and we'll be happy to connect you to it. Um, it is a closed group. I have a question. Oh, good. Yay. What is one other blog that you think every Pittsburgher should be reading? Maybe you or maybe someone else. Or maybe you have a favorite one. Who would you recommend that uh, other people should read? Me, personally? I would like to hear from all of you. I'll go first, since you can. So, you know, you jag off Berg Baby. I think Berg Baby, everybody should read just because it's that good a blog. Um, and, oh, wow, that's really kind of difficult. Um, Joy KMT has a blog, but you have to be a patron of hers to access it. So I, I would encourage people to do that because I think what she has to say is really important. Um, and beyond that, I guess, wow, that's a, it's a hard question. It's a hard question. Um, I think it depends what stance you're coming from. I'm, I'm still always a big fan of Two Political Junkies and the Pittsburgh Comet, which are both um, political blogs. And they, they cover, they can be very micro. And I think that it's helpful to understand things like how, when you want to talk about the SOAR authority what's going on with that. Like, that's a blog that can help you understand what effect that has on your actual day-to-day -day life, uh, more so than, you know, a larger blog was. So pass the baton. Um, so <laughs> this will sound like a cop-out answer a little bit, but I'm a little bit newer to Pittsburgh and also to the Pittsburgh blogging community. And this has been a really great opportunity for me to learn about blogs. So I've been reading Sue's blog for quite a while, and, and I'm becoming familiar with Justin's blog, Halambo. Um, so, so those are ones that I, I'll say everyone should read. Um, I also like Joy's. Joy's, Joy's probably my, one of my favorite Pittsburgh writers. And I, I must be a patient of hers. I didn't know. I mean, I can get to her website pretty easily, joykemet.com. So what's that? You yeah, that's it. it. Yeah, yeah, you, she, should, yeah. You, you must. I must you've, be. You've donated and so oh, forth. Oh, I so, really? Okay, yeah, she's, I got it. Okay. I mean, and it's, it's, that's a whole separate issue, but it's, it's, an, it, it's an important issue about compensating people for the time and energy that they put to create this content we consume yeah. and who has who can do that as a luxury versus who you know needs support in order to be able to continue to do that yeah. work and so that's that's something to consider too I, I absolutely would say because I, I mean I, I may have made some contributions but it's not in the in like the thousand dollars so I don't know what what that what that is but I definitely would recommend it I think her voice is uniquely insightful, period. And she happens to be living in Pittsburgh, but I think she's that voice. Another one that I like that, that um, another blog I like is, um, uh, but not from, not not from Pittsburgh though, which is a guy, the Magical Negro. So he's another writer I like. We're trying to think, and I also like the one that Sue mentioned, like. Uh, 
not because we're common and stuff, but so yeah. But I would recommend, if I had one, I would say Joy. Joy, and it's joykmt.com, I believe. Um, I would just add another blog to that, uh, the Homewood Nation. Um, Ellen Green, he, it's, it's a good blog also um, chronicling, he's a former journalist, so he has a really great writing style, and I think that that, maybe we should put a, we'll put a list on the Facebook group of, of the blogs that we think people should read. And of course the Pittsburgh Common has all, has, has all, has a lot of them on the side. You know, one more I would say too, which is not quite a blog, I don't know if it's, it's more like an online magazine. Um, is 1839, um, which I'm the program officer for at the Heinz Endowment, so there's the self-promotion in that. What is 1839? 1839 is a online magazine. It, it, it was, uh, ed, it's, it's managed by the Kelly Strayhorn Theater. The editor of this first go-round was Damon Young. Obviously another one would be VSB. Very Smart Brothers, that's a, local, that's a local guy, I don't know how I didn't say that. Um, and very cheeky, clever, you know. Um, and then also getting a little bit deeper. Um, of, and then 1839 is an online magazine. It really centers black voices and a variety of black voices. Um, Includes a lot of queer, trans, people of color's voices, including Joy and Michael and others. Absolutely. So absolutely, yeah. it's a yeah. must read. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I put that in the category of all black voices. Um, so uh, that's another one I'd recommend. And you can see it at 1839.com if you look that up, yeah. You should definitely read Very Smart Brothers, though. <laughs> it's, it's one of the best written. It's not a local blog. It, they write about things in Pittsburgh, because Damon's in Pittsburgh, but they, other things as well. But it's just, it's just yeah. We could just go on and on and on, I think. and. Um, you know, there is a blog, um, a group on Facebook called Pittsburgh Bloggers, and you can join that to sort of get some insight into who's blogging and what they're blogging about. People, there's a weekly roundup of links, that sort of information. Um, and, you know, I would encourage you to check out some of the smaller blogs that aren't as well known, I think. Um, anything else that we can answer for you? Great. Well, thank you so much for joining the panel discussion, and um, we're sorry about our presentation, but we, it is going to be, um, on, it's on the Facebook page, and um, they are going to include it in the video of this, um, this, this session when it is um, up on YouTube, so you'll be able to see it, but you can check it out in the head of time, and I think we did pretty well without it. Um, Next year, obviously, we've got to try to get Damon and Joy <laughs> and have a whole conversation with the, uh, see where we've come in terms of, of uh, capturing our, our blogging history. So um, I want to do one little teeny bit of self-promotion. Um, my sponsor for my art project is the Most Wanted Fine Art in Garfield. And in the month of November, we're going to be doing a the second annual Best of the Burgosphere, which is a celebration of all things blogging. So there's an art. There'll be a call for art artists soon, and they'll do an exhibit of blogging of art by bloggers. Some of it is traditional art, and some of it is blog content itself. We're also going to be giving the Best of the Burgosphere Awards away, which every blogger can, we, we it's, it's basically a participation trophy for bloggers. Everybody gets an award. And we're gonna do a panel discussion because it's the 10 year anniversary of the coinage of the term Burgosphere which was created by Bill Tolan, who was blogging for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. And so he's going to be there and some other bloggers from way back in the day talking about the early days of political blogging in Pittsburgh. And that's all gonna be in November, so please keep your eyes open for that. If you feel like you want a break before Thanksgiving and you wanna spend some time with some wry, witty people drinking and beer and in a gallery in Garfield, then that's, what better way to spend a November evening celebrating the art of blogging? So any other final parting words? Uh, no, no. Um, I, I meant to do this at the beginning, but we did have another panelist that was um, going to be included, but for health reasons she couldn't make it. Um, her name is Megan Alston. She's a very dear friend and colleague and provided a lot of support in creating the resource documents as well as a lot of emotional support for myself, I'll say. <laughs> um, so um, I'm very sad she couldn't be here, but um, she'll, she'll be involved in the group. Well, you did a great job of helping Justin and I both 
me as a longer term blog, just as a viewer term blog, both kind of understand some of these issues. So thank you for doing that. I know it was out of your traditional no, day yeah. job. I <laughs> completely appreciate the opportunity to do so and to learn more about it. And it was nice that you said that our blogs are your favorite. That was, that was <laughs> so. Well, I think we're going to let you go to lunch, and um, there's other sessions at 1. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I feel like I'm on a radio and I should have a sign off, but I, you know, I'm just going to trail off into the night and let it be that. So. Thanks for joining us. Have a great afternoon.